2018, and we're going to return to our breast cancer data set to look at a technique from unsupervised uh, learning today. But before we do that, we're going to return to our exploration of sequence alignment, finish that off, and then come back to these slides and talk about some uh, basics of machine learning in a little bit uh, and continue from there. Okay, um, so I'm going to switch to some uh, handwritten slides now. At the end of last class, we were talking about pairwise sequence alignment between two given input sequences, A and B, say. And basically, we're trying to line up those two input sequences in a way that sort of maximizes its likelihood under some evolutionary model. It, that boils down to basically matching as many amino acids or nucleic acids as possible. Um, and mis when mismatches occur, you want to choose mismatches that um, are more likely to occur uh, with respect to the chemistry and physical properties of the amino acids. Uh, so it matches, mismatches, and then insertions and deletions, or sometimes um, commonly right, or collectively called indels, uh, because we don't really know if, uh, in this case with two sequences, whether the um, insertion occurred, uh, let's say, um, along this branch or a deletion occurred along the other branch. So we don't know what was at the, the ancestor. So uh, we just refer to them as indels. And um, we talked a little bit about how we could use the PAM matrices as a way to estimate the probability that an amino acid L would um, flip to an amino acid A over some given evolutionary distance, which would be an estimate of how far those two species, A and B, are apart. That's uh, what's depicted here. And that's basically where we left off last class. Now here, I'm going to use uh, nucleic acid sequences um, because it's got a, they have a smaller alphabet and it saves a bit of writing. But in principle, uh, this, the algorithm I'm going to show works for amino acids with PAM or blossom matrices. Um, and in, in the nucleic acid case, you could use something fancier for your scoring matrix, uh, like a juice canter like model. But I'm not here. I've just made up the scoring matrix. It's very simple. Uh, just to show the algorithm. So a match, an exact match counts for plus two, a transition counts for plus one, A, G, or C, T, and a transversion in green here are um, negative and they uh, count for um, minus two. I see that I made a small mistake there. I'm sorry, that should be a minus two. Okay. Um, that's just a made-up model. It, it does somehow reflect a little bit the Chimera 80 model of nucleic evolution we looked at last class. All right, so here's our scenario. We have our scoring matrix and our gap penalty. Uh, alpha is along the, um, the rows of D. This is what's going to tabulate our, our alignment. And beta is along the columns. Okay, And um, we have zeros in this null row, what I call the null row and the null column. And those zeros are actually what's going to allow us to not charge for gaps that are at either end of alpha or beta at the start or the finish of either of those two sequences. You'll see what I mean in a second. Okay, so the algorithm, this is dynamic programming, is really, really simple to look at, okay? And it says that the ith jth entry of D is equal to the maximum of three possibilities. And the three possibilities, if I stand, for example, here at D11, um, let's call this D00, and I can even write that in there just to, so that we're all on the same page. Um, that's the 00. zero. So uh, here we're at D11, okay, etc. So if we're looking at position D11, its value, D11, is going to be equal to the maximum of uh, D, I minus 1, J minus 1. And so if I'm standing here, in the matrix, d i minus one is one row less and one less column. So I'm standing here. So it's this value, which is zero, um, zero, plus the score of aligning the ith uh, nucleic acid of alpha against the jth nucleic acid of beta. And so that is, in this case here, a versus a, which is a two. It's a high scoring match, right? A versus A. And so 
this part of the equation says that it, it, it simplifies to 2 uh, for the top guy. Now the other possibility is I step back one row um, but stay in the same column. That's this entry here. And so I take that score, which in this case here is a 0, right? And I have to take, I have to pay a cost of minus 1 for it because um, I'm coming from, I have, I, I, when I come from directly above, I'm um, in introducing a gap. And I need to pay minus 1 when I introduce a gap. This is the symmetric case, but now I stay in the same row, but I, I go back one column. And that score is a zero here. But again, I need to pay uh, for a gap when I come from the same row. And so the score is minus one. So clearly the maximum here is this guy here, the two. And so what I do in my matrix is I, I, I do two things. Firstly, I, I update the value of dij. So that's going to be a 2. Uh, let me use a different color here. Let me use black. And I'll use... Now, the second thing we need to do is, is introduce traceback pointers. That's this concept down that these words here. And they tell me which of the three conditions I chose at each step. Now, in this case here, I chose the first one. And so I'm going to put an arrow that goes back like that to record the fact that that's the way I came. That's the path I took. I'm going to use those tracebacks later on to build my alignments. Okay. Let me clean that up a little bit. Uh, get rid of these numbers. Okay. So now that that value is filled in, now we can fill. Now it's 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 like my, you know uh, these games where you now you can um, solve new instances, right? So now I could go, for example, here, and I could look at this value. Okay. And what's that value going to be? So because I, I know that I have the diagonal value resolved, I have its left neighbor and its upper neighbor resolved. So if we go down here, its diagonal is zero, right? Because if I go back one column, one row, I'm at zero. So it's zero plus the score I get for matching G versus an A. And that is um, equal to a plus one. So the value when I come from the diagonal is a 1, right? So I can mark that in, 1. Now, if I come from i minus 1, j, then that means I'm coming from above, right? I'm coming from this guy. And uh, if I come from there, I'm gapping, so I have to pay 0 and then, and, then, and then the gap of minus 1, so the overall score is minus 1. That's not very good. Now, the last case is that I come from my left neighbor. And again, that's a zero. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, when I come from here, oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, let me take that back. Okay. I forgot which one I'm focusing on. I'm focusing on this guy right here. And when I come from above, in this case, it's going to be not a zero, but a two. Okay, that's a two. But I have to pay for a gap, right? I have to pay for a gap, so this is only one. Okay, it's only one because I, I come, I, I have two minus one for the gap. Now, if I come from this direction, then I have zero plus I pay for the gap, so it's minus one, right? So this guy is definitely not the winner. But still, overall, now I have a one here, a minus one here, and a one. So I have two possibilities um, from which I could come. Either I match the G versus an A, or uh, in this direction, or I come from here and I subtract one off because of the gap. That's no problem. What I can do in my matrix is simply two, th two things. Is first, I will put my score of 1. Um, and secondly, I will put two traceback pointers to mark that both of these directions were a tie. I could have come from either way. I guess switch to purple there. That's okay. So when you have a tie, you keep track of both of them. Now I could go over, let's say, to the other ones I could resolve would be either this one or this one. Let's take this one here. This guy is A versus A. So in this part of the recurrence, 
I have uh, the, 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 the A versus A, which is a 2 um, for the score, and a 0 for um, what I had before. So that value is a 2 if I come from the diagonal. If I come from the left neighbor, of course, I'm going to score minus, I'm going to score plus 1 after paying for the gap. And if I come from this direction, it's going to be minus 1. So the best is to come from the um, diagonal and take the match. And now I'm going to have a, uh, a 2 in here. And my traceback pointer is unique like that. Okay, so let's do another one. I can do this guy now. Okay, so now uh, if I'm standing in this position here, the first con this first uh, rule says I look back at the diagonal. It's a 2. And I get the score for matching a G versus an A, and that's a 1, right? So, in fact, this guy would be a 3 according to here, and that's going to be the best because uh, 1 and 2, after I subtract penalties, are both less than 3. So that's an easy guy, and that means that I'm going to put a 3 here, and it's going to give me a trace, a unique trace back towards the diagonal, okay? Now, the next guy we might resolve is this guy here. So this is a G versus an A, so that's a 1. Um, so I could put a 1 from the diagonal. This will be negative 1 after I pay for the gap. And the upper guy will be a 0. So I'll, I'll want to come from the diagonal here. And it'll be a, a 1, right? And if I come into now this guy, um, this guy here, I'm looking at a G versus an A. I think it's the same case. I'm going to take a one uniquely from the um, from the uh, diagonal, right? And that's going to be a one here. And now we can come back and we can look uh, at something like this guy here. Okay. Now, if I come from the diagonal, it's a one plus a G versus an A, which is a one. So that would be a two. If I come from here, it's a zero because of the gap. And if I come from here, it's going to be a two after I pay for the gap. So it's a tie. It's either this guy or that guy, if I'm not mistaken. So what I'll do is I'll put my 2 in here, and I'll note that there are two ways to get to that location with that score. Okay? Oops. That's not very clean. Let me see here. That's a 2. And... All right. Okay, a couple more, right? So this is what we do. We fill out the whole matrix this way, right? It's kind of boring. But if I come in here, I look at that guy. It's a G versus an A. So that's a 2. 1 plus 1 is 2. Uh, well, sorry, G versus an A is a 1, but it's 1 plus 1, so it would be a 2. And then they wouldn't be good because you have, a, um, you have to pay for the gap. So you're going to get a 2 here, and it's going to be a unique traceback. Um, this guy here, A versus A, if I come from the diagonal, I'll get a 2. Everybody agrees, right? I, stop me if I'm wrong. If I, if I look at this guy, um, that's an A versus an A. That's an interesting case because now it's 1 plus 2 is a 3. So that, that's going to be way better. And we're going to choose this guy. And now uh, we'll fill that out. Okay, so I'm not going to fill up this whole matrix. But I want to stop right now because you can already see these alignments forming. Okay, so now the thing is, normally you would fill this whole matrix out and then you would use the trace back. But let's start here, okay, and look at um, alpha and beta. And let's start with this guy first. Okay, so that's a 3. And when I come from the diagonal, it means I took... Essentially, I took the match of G versus A. So that's a G in, in alpha and an A in beta, okay? And now I'm at this guy. And because I took the diagonal, it, it, meant that, it means that I took the alignment of A versus A in alpha and beta, okay? And now I'm back at the origin and I'm finished. And so the score of this alignment, right, is 2 for A versus A. And G versus A is a 1, so my score is 3, right? That's one alignment. Basically, it uses the first part of both of these sequences, right? 
It's not a perfect match because the G versus A is a mismatch. Now, oops, I can build other match, at least one more match that has a score of three. For example, I could start here in my matrix. Uh, where is a good color? Purple. Here. Now that says I took, when I, I follow the diagonal, I took um, that letter, so it's an A in alpha, and it's in A in beta, okay? It's actually this A in alpha, right? In fact, I'm gonna have to move that down. I think I might need more space to show you what I'm doing here, all right? So now um, I'm here, okay? And that, because I came from the diagonal again, this diagonal, it meant that I took the match of G versus A, an alpha and beta respectively. Okay, so now I, I go back and I'm at the origin. And basically, I've used these two um, uh, nucleic acids of beta, but I've skipped over um, AGG in alpha, right? I skipped over all of this, and then I, I matched only that against there. Now the score of this alignment in the cost-free end gap, whoa, that's a really terrible line, is really simple because the, the, the end gaps, when the gaps occur at the end of either alpha or beta or at the beginning, they don't cost anything. And so here, that's zero, zero, zero. That's why we have these values in this row and uh, in column, okay? So they don't cost anything. G versus A is a score of one, and A versus A is a score of two. And so that gives me an overall score of three. Okay, so I'm gonna let you on your own as a good exercise, uh, I think, is to complete that matrix, that alignment, okay, and compute the globe, uh, and, then, and then basically use the tracebacks to um, build different alignments. Now, one question that we haven't gone through is what happens when you reach some place where you have more than one choice um, to trace back? Like, for example, here, I could have come from this direction or I could have come from this direction. And the answer is it doesn't matter. Both alignments that you generate, they'll look differently because one will be a match and the other one will be a gap, but they'll have the same score. Okay, so that's the uh, essential idea of um, dynamic programming and sequence alignment. Now, in general, we, we usually use a local alignment and it gets a little bit more complicated. And um, our notion of a gap here is, is a little bit naive. We're just using a constant value. I think I have a slide coming up to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, maybe it's next. Okay, uh, I should say too that, yeah, um, there's two things here. One is that we wouldn't use such a simple scoring matrix. And the second thing is that we wouldn't normally use a simple gap like minus one or minus two, some constant. The more appropriate gap penalty that you'll see people use in, in the literature and also when you go to the NCBI is an affine or another term for that is a linear gap penalty. The idea is really simple and dynamic programming can solve it too, but it's a little bit more complicated and I don't think it really helps you understand um, how it works. But here's the basic idea. When I have a gap here, it's of length four, one, two, three, four, and this gap is of length three. Now, in the, in the way that we looked at it before, this one would cost minus four and this would be minus three. Actually, what, what turns out to model reality a bit better is that you have a gap constant, which is usually quite big. It'd be like minus 10 or something. So it's sort of like, you know, you pay a lot when you start a gap, right? And then each base after that, you pay a little bit. So you pay like minus one for the gap penalty. So four times that in this case, and three times that in this case, but in both cases, you paid like a minus 10 or some larger value that's the gap constant. So basically each base, each of the, or not base, but each position of the gap costs you a little bit. Um, uh, and so you're paying per, per um, position. 
And that's because um, you don't want giant gaps, right? That, that stops gaps from being extremely large. But that's, that again is, um, that can be solved quite easily with dynamic programming, but it, it's, um, those equations are a little bit more uh, involved, etc. But you'll see uh, with Aki's um, lab when he covers BLAST is that you're allowed to enter both a gap constant and a gap penalty into your equations in addition to your scoring matrices, etc. So uh, I would really recommend that you sit down with that um, uh, uh, matrix from my previous page and try to work through it and build up different alignments from it that have um, the highest score. Okay, I'll see you in a few minutes. All right, we're back. So uh, now we want to look at some basic definitions in machine learning and continue to learn there. So first, uh, yeah, machine learning, you know, where it comes from, it's going to be, and where it's going, this is a major part of the latter part of this course. Uh, the idea of teaching computers to think or to make decisions has been around for quite a while. Marvin Minsky and Professor MIT, who was some, one of the first theoreticians to sort of start thinking about what um, relationship there is, if there is one, between uh, the biochemistry of our brains um, and how consciousness or what consciousness is and whether that could be programmed. Um, we've come a long way in our understanding since then, but uh, yeah, the best movie of all time is uh, War Games, that's clear. Um, if you haven't seen War Games, then you, you probably don't really belong in this class, but should watch it really quickly. Uh, let's see here. Um, oh, it's not taking me to uh, to um, the page. So let's see here. Uh, open the browser, right? There we go. So uh, this was a classic movie from the 1980s. Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Killen. I have my own medical practice, and I've been using Doodly now for a few weeks to create these really. David Lightman was a master at computer games. A fast thinker. Oh, David! Maybe you could tell us who first suggested the idea of reproduction without sex. Your wife? Get out, Lightman. And a promising student Hi. at an old game. Hi. With an electronic twist. Are those your grades? Yeah. I don't think that I deserved it. Do you? go to jail for that only if you're over 18 this computer company is coming out with these amazing new games in a couple of months and i want to play those games wow what we got something he found the right code word to play the game we're in but it was the wrong computer shall we play a game i can't ask you that how about mobile thermal nuclear war fine all right what the hell? They're trajectory headings for multiple impact re-entry vehicles. How's that, man? I don't know, but it's great. All stations, this is Crystal Palace. I wonder if I should use my subs. 22 Typhoon class submarines departing Petropavlov. What in the hell's happening here? Oh my god. Shall we play? I have seven correction, eight. That's eight Redbirds. Get on the sack. Tell them to flush the bombers. Russians are still denying everything, sir. Who are you working with? Nobody. I don't have to leave you. Today we have Soviet missile warning. Based on your arrest, funding indictment for espionage. Espionage? Confidence is high. I repeat, confidence is high. Cobra Day, is this an exercise? Negative, this is not an exercise. Be the president on the horn. It's still playing the game. It's going to start a war. Close up the mouth. Game or is it real? War games playing soon at a theater near you. Shall we play? Yes, yeah, so they cover a lot of territory in that movie. I need to show you one more scene to get my point across here. Oh, once again, it's not working. This was a classic, classic movie from I think 1983. Or, yeah, I guess 83. Uh, same year that uh, Reagan was in power and the uh, Cold War was in full swing, etc. 
also there was a TV show called The Day After or The Morning After or something like that, which was all about nuclear catastrophe. And uh, uh, sorry guys. This is near the end of the movie. It's a climax, if you can't tell. Six up. There's no way you can win that game. I know that. It doesn't. It hasn't learned. Is there no way to make it play itself? Yes, number of players zero. Genius. I'm not sure why you need to type the word zero. It seems like a poor interface design. to play tic-tac-toe, but actually could abstract to the next level that global nuclear, thermonuclear war was also futile in the same way that you know, nobody could win. It's quite profound, really, at the time, but it had ele the movie had elements of hacking and elements of uh, you know artificial intelligence, uh, machine consciousness, etc. Of course, in our studio, in such a situation, we can just go and hit session interrupt R and not really you know, have to worry about blowing up Whopper. And this is my first computer ever that was back around this exactly the same time when I was about 12 years old. The TI-90 Texas Instrument 99-4A. Clearly, this was before uh, marketing mattered in the computer world. Um, so, yeah, machine learning, um, that's where all that is going, right? So, uh, there's several different types. and. Um, there's supervised, unsupervised, and uh, reinforcement learning, at least three types, and we'll talk a little bit about each today. Supervised, um, the goal is to learn mappings from the input variables X to output variables using a training set uh, of, of labeled, so it's using a label, this is a training set of labeled um, examples. So our input, the first example would be X1, and we know the answer y1 and we get x2 an example and we know the answer y2 and we do this and we get or we get like capital n um, examples and example uh, and um, its solution so we hope that n these days is quite large and and that's um, you, you might actually even hear this in kind of the common you know media these days is the idea of big data um, what's changed well okay so there has been theoretical improvements in our understanding of machine learning since whopper and, and uh, war games that's for sure but at the same time what we have now is a lot more data we have very large n um, this is especially true for companies like google and amazon foot facebook etc where they're collecting lots of examples of uh, of you know what you do you know, and what you're you know, and what the answer is so what you look at on Amazon, what products, and what you buy, right? They have example, you know, Google stores information about um, your buying patterns, your 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 movement patterns, your uh, all sorts of things about your 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 writing style, maybe from your thing, and they match that up with um, uh, outputs, right? That uh, you know, will you buy this product? Um, will you uh, um, subscribe to this channel, etc.? Will you your behavior, right? Um, 
So a more concrete example to start with might be something like X could be the height of an individual's, and we also know their sex, right? So, you know, this person is 5 foot 12 or 5 foot 11, say, and their, their sex is male, and this person is 5 foot 10, and they're female, etc., right? So we might, this is a silly example, is we might want to try to predict gender, uh, sex from um, the height of the individual. And I think that it would kind of work, right? It wouldn't be the most accurate. There's certainly a lot of overlap in the height of men and women. But I think men tend to be slightly higher, uh, large, um, taller than women. In general, though, we don't usually have just one measurement of, for each uh, each input, so each observation, we usually have several attributes, like the, we know have the, the height, the weight, IQ, education level. We have all sorts of things, like we've seen many times now in the Tara Oceans data set, in the breast cancer data set, these are rows, that, and, they have, and these are variables or attributes. And um, we also have, because it, um, it's supervised, we have this output, which is, for example, in the breast cancer data set, it might be something like um, survival, right? Five-year survival, yes or no, right? Uh, so we wouldn't want to be using height, weight, and IQ to predict survival, but the idea uh, in maybe the, um, uh, the the bracket data set that we have, with it, we'd be, we, we would be looking at the stage, grade, gene expression levels, and we would try to predict the output from known examples, right, that we have in our data set. So generally, we call the X part um, the attributes, the design matrix, okay? So the height, weight, education. These are features or attributes or covariates, okay? And we distinguish them from Y, the output, that, that response variable. So we, we call that first part to be um, X. So it, you know, it concretely, in terms of our table for, let's say, the breast cancer data set, uh, if we put our, our response variable Y, the output as... Uh, you know, survival, that would sort of be removed from the, the tibble and the remaining tibble would be the, the attributes that we want to predict on. And so that would be the design matrix. Or maybe we would remove the other columns that we're not using to predict um, outcome. Like, for example, you wouldn't use the ID or the ID codes, that kind of thing. There's different forms of supervised learning. So when the variable y, our output variable, um, for example, sex, is, uh, it, it's called the response variable. It could have different types. Um, it could be categorical. And that means that y has a, has a finite number of levels, like finite number of different values. So for example, well, so sometimes I should say, because we come back to that today, when we have a set like C, and set C could be um, 1, 2, 3. It could be good, bad, ugly. It could be true, false. It could be... I don't know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? Anything that's a finite number of items, we think of them as a set. And we can write this, these, these um, lines to mean the size of the set. So, for example, here, uh, the size of this, right, is 3, 3, and 2, right? Okay, so when y is a categorical variable, we'd say that it's a classification problem. So, for example, uh, Definitely, when we're predicting survival, not survival, alive, dead, that's a, that's a, that's a categorical, why would be a categorical variable? Um, and, and in fact, because alive, dead, we only have two classes, we'd call it a binary classification problem. When we have multi, we, it's often that we have more possible outcomes, so it might be multi-class. So it, it might be that we're predicting, for example, um, uh, the day of the week, somebody will, um, uh, you know, buy from Amazon uh, what day they shop the most on, maybe that's a Saturday, then you would be predicting um, seven you know, different levels of the variable Y, right, each day of the week. It's not the best example, but I think you get the idea. Um, in other cases, y y you know, if we were trying to predict um, uh, a drug um, uh, or trying to, you know, there might be multiple drugs in the study, et cetera, that way. Um, uh, so if you're trying to predict what, what drug the patient will benefit from, there might be a long list of drugs, but still a finite list, so it's categorical. Sometimes we have ordinal response variables. Um, so for example, your grade would be ordinal, it's ordered, right? 
you know, you, you don't want to be, you don't want to be plus, but it's better than a B, A minus is better than a B plus, et cetera. So there's a definite notion of ordering, right? That's not the case if you're predicting survival of dead. There's no ordering there per se. Um, so sometimes you have an ordering. And the main thing though is that, you know, all of these examples are for categorical uh, situations when y, y can take on real values. So for example, here it's in the set of minus ne ne negative infinity to positive infinity or any number above zero, for example, as a temperature, it could be, well, that'd be zero, below or a positive zero, um, or it could be a um, number of days to relapse, right? So yeah, th this is a subtle, this is a subtle difference on one time, you know, one situation, you might be trying to predict outcome as uh, a live dead, that's a binary classification problem. But if you're trying to predict um, the number of months of survival post treatment or post diagnosis, that would be measured in say days or months, and that would more most likely take a more uh, that would be like a regression problem, right? Even if it's you know you can't, you might argue there's a finite number of days or months anyone can live, regardless of whether they have breast cancer or not, right? But still, there's so many possibilities. We would really not. It wouldn't really make sense to um, model that as a categorical variable, potentially. But you know, you'd have to basically have a different. If you wanted to measure time to, um, days to relapse, if you measure in days, you might span over ten years. So there would be like three thousand five hundred different levels, and that doesn't make too much sense. Okay, and oh, sorry, yeah, when y is real, the response variable is real, the output is um, real then we call it a regression problem. Okay, this is a fun slide. Um, uh, here's an example of supervised learning, right? It's kind of a nice, nice example, I think. So um, here's our training set. Um, there's two, it's, it's expressed in two different ways here, uh, visually and as a matrix, right? So this is your, your design matrix here. Uh, you have different features, color, shape, and size. I think that's the three main ones. So color here can be, what is that, purple or blue, I guess they're saying. Uh, maybe that's a, a blue, a purple, a red, a green. I think it's different. Yeah, and you have shape. So you have this square, donut, uh, um, star, an ellipse, uh, a moon shape, um, and an arrow shape, right? And then you have a size. So um, definitely, uh, what's, what's an example here of differences in size, I guess? This ellipse is much bigger than this ellipse. Well, uh, I guess it's slightly different. It's a bit fatter on this one, but it's definitely bigger than these ellipses here. And so um, the question then is that, you know, you're, you're given examples, okay? This is a binary classification problem because you're either going to put them into this set, yes, or this set, no. And you want to figure out the rules for doing that, okay? So for ex and, then, and then that's our learning set. And now the second part of supervised learning is that you're given new objects that are described by X, your design matrix, and your goal is to predict the label. So all of these guys here and here are, um, you're told these guys, the blue square, that guy here is in label one, okay? And the red ellipse, um, well, I guess uh, that's supposed to be um, uh, well, I guess, what is it? The red ellipse is very big. Yeah, so this is label zero, right? I guess that's right, because it's much bigger. That red ellipse is much bigger than this red ellipse, and that's in label one. So this is label zero, and this is label one. Okay, yes, no. I guess yes is supposed to be the one, and no is supposed to be the zero. All right, hopefully everybody understands the game we're trying to play. If not, stop the video and... and um, Make sure you do before we continue. All right, so now we're told we have entries to describe um, the moon. So that would be the moon shape, purple, with a certain size and centimeters. Okay, and which one does it belong? Well, um, think about that. Stop, you know, each time you should stop the video and think about it yourself. Uh, one argument I think would be that it should belong in the yes category, the label one, because we don't see any purple down here. Okay, so that would maybe suggest that we would put purple 
on this side. Um, if there's a good argument otherwise, you should let me know in the lecture time about why you would want to put purple into the no box, into the zero box. Now, what about this guy here, the yellow uh, with the rings? Well, definitely we see a ring in both. So, I, I mean, the shape, and there's not like more rings in this one than this one. So, um, I'm not sure uh, what would be the rationale uh, of putting it into either one. Now, there's two yellows on this side, and there's three yellow objects on this side. Uh, maybe a rule might be that you would put it in the box with the most. Um, I don't know. I think it'd be um, challenging to know uh, what side, if there's other, other opinions out there um, of where it belongs. Um, maybe we could put it here to begin with, right? And now uh, we come back and we ask, well, what's this arrow now? Where does it belong? Well, uh, maybe we would put the arrow over here because um, it's the only other arrow, right, based on uh, shape. Although, be careful because, well, we, we, we put this guy into this box because it based on color, right? Um, the only other color. So now this purple here, there's no purple in this box. Uh, so I guess we're saying then purple overrides the shape somehow, if we put it in this box, right? But if we put it in this box, we say that shape is more important than color, right? So what is our algorithm really for deciding that? And, um, now, if we were to put this guy in here and say, well, I think shape is more important than color. Now, let's go back here. Our, our rationale for putting this guy in this box was because there was no purple. But now, this guy is there, so in theory, we could have purple. So now, where do we put the half moon? Okay, I guess we could still say, well, there's more purple in this side than that side, but, um, well, you can see that as we move along and we see more examples, uh, the rules, they may change, those examples may change our thinking, right? As we start to write down the rules, when we see examples, um, then we'll see some kind of counterexamples to our thinking, we'll change our rules, and then we have to kind of revisit what we did before, right? So, um, yeah, it's a really tricky problem. This is machine learning. so. And I guess the point here too is that there's very few examples, right? What's it based on? What's the what's our what's our prior here? How much how much have we really observed? I mean, so we see this, you know, what is that about uh, ten and ten objects? I'm not even sure it's ten. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight and uh, nine. So we haven't even seen twenty objects, and then we see the next object we get is a moon. And it's a completely new shape that we haven't seen before. So maybe there's lots more shapes to come, right? Um, maybe if we were to see a million uh, examples, then we would know exactly where moon goes, right? It would, it would be, make it be, it would make it easier, perhaps, to um, uh, form rules. But that's only true if there's not a million and one different shapes, right? So it's really a complicated, tricky. Um, problem. It's a very nice example from Leslie. Okay, well, one of the um, most important tools that we have in machine learning is probability theory. And unfortunately, a lot of students in biology still to this day don't receive nearly enough probability theory. This is not the same thing as biostats or statistics. It sits underneath a good portion of statistics but it's distinct from statistics in many ways. And it, it makes you, the more you know about probability theory, the more you're able to assess how rare or how common um, situations or observations that arise are, okay? And um, there's a beautiful website that I would really recommend. Uh, in fact, it's on the required reading for part of it, but I would recommend that you spend some time with, this is from, Brown University. Uh, I need to make the window a bit smaller. Sorry. Let's see if I can fit it in here. Okay. 
shift it over. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful website. Uh, in general, they have um, uh, basics of set theory, so probability theory, expectation and variance, chance events, compound probabilities. This is like the intersection and union. They're, it's a very, very nice. I, I wanted to show you today uh, the idea of conditional probability because this is so, it's so foundate, it's so fundamental in, in machine learning. And I'm not sure that many of you have seen it. So here's the idea, right? It, it's pretty simple. So you have some space, right? Where balls are falling from the sky. Okay, you can see them dropping down here. And um, so they fall between this point and they fall between this point. And we sort of have in here three ledges here, here, and here, A, B, and C. And so this means that like A is some fraction of the total space from zero to one. So I would say what A is about. Uh, well, I can make A, oops, I can make A as big as the whole space. Oh, I'm cutting off a bit. Let me, let me come up here. I make the probability, so I, I can make the orange space as big as my entire window. And that means that every ball will hit that region called A. So the probability of A is one. It has to occur. Every ball that drops from the heavens hits probability A. Conversely, if I make A small down to zero, now my probability of A is zero. No balls hit that space. Okay, so I can go out here and now that's back to 35%. Or well, let's make it a bit bigger. Let's say we could make the probability of A to be, that should be around 50%. That was really good actually. Now, I can move B and I can move C around too. And uh, I can change their sizes too. So if I make B to be um, one, just like A, the probability that a ball hits B is one, right? And I can reduce the size of B to something very small too. Now I can ask all sorts of things about the joint events. So how many balls hit all three? Well, if basically, if all of these things were one, then that's really easy to rationalize about, right? Then all of these guys are one, then the probability that, uh, that a ball hits all three events is going to be one. And the probability is still going to be zero if they all are zero, right? Okay. But let's put them back to, say, smaller values, half or a third or something like that. Okay. Now, the conditional probability, the probability of, let's say, uh, what's the probability that a ball uh, hits B given that, it's hit, that, that it hit A when it's like this? Now, let's suppose that A, let's make this A to be, it's too big, let's make it 50. Uh, it's still 63. 59. 56. Well, it's a bit annoying that you can't see. So that's close enough. That's about 50 there. And let's make this to be one quarter. So that's going to be, yeah, it's about one quarter. So what is the probability? Let's get C out of the way. What is the probability that, that a ball that's hit, that, that hits A also hits B? Well, the probability that it hits A is 50%, right? Because if it comes over here, it doesn't hit A. Now, if it hits A, what's the probability that it hits B? Well, because B is completely within A, and B is half the size of A, the probability that it hits both A and B is a half times uh, a half. So the probability is a quarter. So one quarter of all balls will hit A and B. Now, uh, sorry, yeah. What is the probability that... If I know that a ball has hit A, that it hits B. Okay. What is the probability that a ball that I know has hit A hits B? That's going to be 50%, not a quarter, right? Because 
That's the probability of A given B. Okay, so here, the probability of A given B. So, for example, if I come in here and I make A to be 50%, roughly 50%, yeah, and I make the probability of, of B to be, uh, let's say, 25%, okay, now B is contained within A, so if I ask if a ball is hit A, right, then what's the probability it hits B? It's going to be 50%. So it's written like this. The way that we read this equation is the probability that B occurs, the ball hits B, given that, and that's what that pipe means, the ball is hit A. So basically what that does is it throws out all the balls that hit neither of them over here. Okay. Now, what's the probability of B given A? So, uh, sorry, of A given B, this one here. So what that means is that I want to know, I know that the ball hits B. What is the probability that a ball that hit B hits A? Well, it's 100%, right? Why? Because B is completely contained within this region of, of A, right? So if I know that the ball hit B, then it must have hit A, all right? Now, what is the probability of A and B? That means that the ball hit both A and B. That's 25%. Why? Because there's a 50% chance that the ball hits A because any ball, half the balls don't hit A at all. And then with because A is twice as big as B, half of the balls that hit A, of total balls, are all, and half of those hit B. And that's going to mean that's going to be 25%. Okay. Um, yeah, so conditional probability is, um, is extremely, extremely important in computational biology and machine learning because we're often saying, well, uh, things of the form, you know, given that the woman's tumor was grade three and that she had a lifestyle uh, where she smoked and that her BMI was a certain level, um, what is the chance what is the probability that she has good outcome right so this 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 bar given that right so this b is the is what we know about the tumor and we're asking we're rationalizing about good outcome or bad outcome a is the event that we're trying to predict so basically what we're saying is you know given um in this to go back to this statement here uh uh, well, sorry, in this case here, um, uh, given what we know about the tumor, what, what can we predict about the future, essentially? Okay, I invite you to please read and spend some time to make sure that you understand um, the notions of conditional probability. It's uh, really fundamental in, in science. And make sure that you understand what the joint probability is. That's that, you know, it's like the AND gate, right? What's the probability, lastly, before we go on, of, oops, what happened there? Oops, oops, oops. I didn't want to go all the way up. I don't know why I, there. So what about I asked the question, what is the probability now of, well, I can't um, adjust this. Uh, I guess I have to go back. Yeah, here. Um, what if I asked the question, what is the probability of A or B or C in this example? So this is basically, uh, how does this work again? B and C, I want the universe. If this was say one third, one third, one third, what is the probability that a ball hits A or B or C? And it's one, because there's no way for a ball to fall here Maybe I'm lying. Maybe there's like a small edge in there. It's not supposed to be there. And of course, if any of these events get more probable, right, they take up more space, it still stays one, right? And if I make them all the same size, but they line up, then the probability of A and B and C, what's that equal to? 
Well, it's just the, it's the fraction of this size, which looks to be about a third, divided by the whole size. And because they all line up, then it, the ball hits everybody or it hits nobody. And so the probability of the, uh, and, uh, of the or is, is still uh, one third. So the and, or, and the conditional probability, um, let's talk about them in class if you uh, aren't sure what they mean. Probability theory gives us this very sound quantitative way to rationalize about data and how rare or how common um, observations are, events are. And, and that helps us um, design algorithms that can um, you know, basically uh, predict why well. And we can understand why it's predicting why well. And that's essentially what then leads us to uh, what leads to the power of machine learning. and, and um, the power to assist in our decision making. Uh, so we have a training set U, and usually in machine learning, and we hope that that set is large. And, and that means that we have a lot of examples of the input variables and the output variable, okay? And if we're learning a binary classifier, for example, zero, one, good or bad, on or off, um, what we're trying to do is basically predict the output variable Y given what we know about that case, right? And all of the previous knowledge U, that's our learning set. So this U doesn't really represent the data of that particular, say, patient, if this is bad outcome. If Y is bad outcome, then X represents what we know about the tumor. So molecular, her two status, or the patient's lifestyle, or the grade, or you know, clinical aspects, et cetera. That's what we know about that tumor. What Y represents, for example, good or bad outcome, survival or death. U represents all the other examples we have in our, at our disposal of other women's tumors, um, their outcome and their stage and grade and lifestyle, et cetera. So that's our background knowledge, right? And that's what we rely on is that large data set to tell us how to predict Y from the, uh, the design matrix X. Um, yeah, and it should be quite large, right? I, you can see why we, we wouldn't be able to do this just on a few examples. Okay, so one thing with the conditional probability is that, you know, you, you can see right away that the probability that a woman has bad outcome given the state of her tumor and her clinical profile and what we know, um, uh, uh, oh, there's a typo there, that should be you. But, I'm sorry, I made a typo. That should be you, and that should be you. And what we know about other women's tumors, plus the probability that she's good outcome, the other case, given what we know about the other tumors, has to be equal to one, right? So one of the two cases has to, has to occur. In fact, this equation probably should include another variable in there called M, and we'll come back to this in a little bit, but M is the model of how we take the information about X and combine it to make a prediction of why. I mean, it's one thing to say that we know the clinical status, or the grade stage, the, the molecular status of her tumor, but how do we formally combine that information into a prediction of outcome? Okay, I put this up here because uh, Michelle asked a question last class about um, exploring mixtures of likelihood, parsimony, uh, this is supposed to be hype, not hybrid, but with a Y, like, you know, Elon Musk, or I guess not, it's more pure electric, right, but uh, a Toyota Prius or something, hybrid. Okay, so she asked a question about combining uh, likelihood and parsimony, and MAP, the maximum a posterior probability is kind of similar to that where your decision-making is basically uh, of the form um, when you evaluate the probability of good outcome given what you know about her tumor, not Michelle's, but the, the patient's tumor, and what uh, you, you've seen in the past about breast cancer behavior, uh, if that's greater than the probability of bad outcome uh, for the same attributes of the woman's tumor, and uh, well, it should be, again, a... Uh, you 
not a Y, I'm not sure why I'm making that mistake, uh, then you would choose good outcome. Otherwise, you would choose the other. Um, so, you know, you could think about that um, on your own here. I, I put this up as something to reflect on. Uh, if you go through this example and you try to assign probabilities to certain events, right? So, it, okay, so let me give you one example here to start off with. Um, the reason we put per, uh, the uh, purple moon in the yes class before was based on color, uh, as we hadn't seen that shape before. So, um, yeah, what's the probability? It's essentially when you put this into a probabilistic statement, you're saying, what's the probability it's in class one, given um, what we know from the uh, its attributes, right? So it's purple, it's a moon, etc. cetera. Uh, and what we've seen before, and the U here is all of these examples, both good and bad, right? Now, U is not very big, right? So, uh, you know, it's tricky to estimate these, but these, these probabilities, but certainly um, U here, if it was to grow larger, uh, our, our, our belief either in one of the two outcomes is likely to, to, to uh, increase. Okay, so let's look at a real example of supervised learning. This is from the IRIS data set in R. Uh, you've probably seen it already because many examples online for R use the, this data. Um, we have three different flowers. This is the, they're irises, but three different irises. So Satoza, I believe this is the Versicolor, and this is Virginica. Um, our goal, so our goal is to classify these guys. So this is our, res, our response variable. Now it's a categorized, it's a classification problem because there's only three, a finite number of different levels that um, we can choose between. It's not regression. Now, uh, the quality here is not great, so I'm going to write this out. There are four variables that are measured for each um, flower. This is sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. And, well, this is just a um, uh, same thing on this y-axis here we have the four variables and the diagonal here each diagonal it represents just the distribution of that variable so sepal length has this nice um, distribution i guess it looks almost normal same thing for sepal width it looks almost binomial for um, petal length and for petal width so this is overall this distributions are over all three types of flowers and then in, in here we see a combination. I'm going to go to the next slide. So we get the, the, our input here, our design matrix are these four attributes for every flower. And I believe in the iris data set, there's 150 examples. So if I'm not mistaken here, Satoza is red. Um, uh, green is Versicolor. Oops, I should write the same way. So Versicolor is green. And the third one is uh, Virginica. Um, so it be, we could write, yeah, Virginica, that should be enough, is then going to be blue, okay? And um, hopefully it's big enough here to see, I'll, I'll again right here, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. So, so the goal here, right, is, is to eyeball this and ask, can we build a classifier of um, uh, for each of these types of flowers uh, using these four variables. So let's try something first. Let's use just sepal length as a classifier. So if I look at the length um, uh, of, of, of the flower itself um, on this axis, right, let's say, I don't think there's any way to draw a line that's going to separate um, green from blue, the uh, Virginica and Versicola. Uh, uh, what's, it called? what's it called? The Versicolor. Now the red, yeah, I think that you could draw a line about here, and that would separate a lot of the red from the, um, the uh, blue, but the green um, are blurring or you know, smearing across there. So, that's not going to set, separate all three types of flowers. 
Um, now, if I were to use, say, pedal width in this graph uh, on, let's say, here, if I look at pedal width and I come in, so if I draw a line here, well, it's going to be very bad, right? I'm going to, if I draw it here, I make one mistake for red. There's red on both sides, just one, but it doesn't separate the green from the blue. The green from blue, if I come over here, maybe pedal width, if I look at that, it's not too bad. Because if I was to say, okay, well, anything with a pedal width below this value is red. Anything with a pedal width uh, in between these two values is green. And anything over is purple. That actually doesn't, um, that actually doesn't do too badly. Now, it, the devil's in the detail. There will be, it seems, a few points that um, uh, may not be um, correct there's quite a bit of intermixing between green and purple but definitely it seems to be promising is there any plot here where green and purple are really separated um, I think maybe this one is slightly better right because on this the sepal width with the petal width together maybe gives you a better delineation between green and purple and so now I could basically draw a line that's diagonal or not quite straight orthogonal that would separate those three um, uh, different flowers, those classifications. And so, what we, you know, this the form of this model would be something like if my um, uh, my petal width is below uh, this value, right? Along the, this, this line here is described as a function of both the pedal width and the sepal width. So I'd say, you know, if I'm on this side of that line, I predict red, uh, and that's just um, Satosa. And if I'm on this side of the line, I pick either green or blue. And then I look at this line to make that decision there between uh, green and, and blue. Uh, maybe I think I said, I said red and blue before, but this one clearly divides red from green and blue. This line divi divides um, blue from the rest okay so that's the idea of supervised learning so we know what the answer is here we know what flower it is and we see these attributes and we try to figure out the model right so to go back to this previous slide um, a little bit further back here i said we need that model right we should add that into the equation and now that model is basically the rules right it's not just looking at what all these examples, it's also how to combine that information into rules for predicting what kind of flower we're looking at. Supervised learning comes up in all sorts of domains, and these slides are a bit hopelessly out of date from a couple of years ago. It's such a fast-moving area. One thing, for example, uh, is, is, it, um, is to predict handwriting. So this um, MNIST data set, M-N-I-S-T, this I think was produced by the U.S. Postal Office and it showed, um, it had images of hundreds of um, uh, new numbers uh, written by different people, you know, that they received, I guess, on letters. And uh, they know the real answer and they've annotated here, appears seven. So humans have went in and they've decided, okay, that's a five and that's a nine, that's a four, et cetera. And of course, the post office is, learned, is interested in the supervised learning here because in general, they want a computer that can scan the um, handwriting and tell with high precision what the right number is. And um, so that data set is often used by machine learning people as a benchmark for their algorithms. So that pe different people come up with different ideas to try and, and predict um, uh, different algorithms, right? Different uh, based on different ideas for for reading handwriting, right? Um, another example is, for example, uh, is, um, is is automated face detection in scenes. Uh, it doesn't have to be a face; it could be a toaster, it could be a car, uh, especially with driverless cars these days. Uh, there's all sorts of issues of you know trying to pick out every, everything from animals and people in the street to rocks and uh, bumps in the road to stop signs and um, other cars, of course. So object detection is certainly a big problem, uh, a big challenge, I'd say. 
Uh, so, you know, everybody's been going around for a long time now on, on social media and they, they basically upload their photos and often they tag them. You know, that's Facebook uh, nicely offers that functionality that we're allowed to tag people in images and put their name there. They love that because you're adding to their data set um, of, of supervised examples. Now they add that row that says, oh, that's Martha, you know, and that's Bob, right? And that goes into their big database and they use that to train their machine learning algorithms to do facial recognition and identify exactly where the faces are in this in this picture. And they, they tend to work very well, as you guys probably know these days. And even your cameras have that kind of um, uh, functionality in them now too, when you're taking a picture that it, uh, it starts to understand what it's looking at, right? Now, that's all classification. We could be using regression, of course, when, when for example, the, the variable y uh, well, for example, gender is called the response variable. When Y takes real values like age, time, temperature, we call this problem a regression. So gender is not one. That would be a, not a good example. It, I'm, yeah. So uh, age, time, temperature. I mean, you know, there's a finite range for temperature, but still they're real numbers, right? So it would make sense to model it as a regression. So typically what we're you know, usually the, this, the response variable is somehow on the y-axis and, you know, each of your, um, uh, each of your uh, attributes, right, um, let's say the first attribute would be along the x-axis, the second attribute would be along the z-axis, etc. So you have multidimensional data, right, and that's uh, hard to visualize, but that's the essential idea. And you know, it doesn't need to be a line. We could be fitting with a um, polynomial or quad, you know, um, or even exponentials, et cetera, as you guys probably know from things like um, COVID-19. Uh, we're often fitting um, data to these different types of curves. Okay. Yeah, so regression is super powerful. Okay, so that's basically the two forms of supervised learning. And then what is unsupervised learning? Okay, so here the training set consists only of the inputs, but we don't have the outputs uh, variables for y. So we're not given these things down here. They're, they're hidden from us, or, or, or we just don't know them at all. I mean, um, yeah. We're just given really the actual design matrix x. And, and the goal is pretty broad. It's you know, to find interesting patterns in the data. So uh, we might call this knowledge discovery or data mining. It's, you, you, basically, you could think of um, collecting a lot of information on people's behavior. And you might ask a question like, which people have the same kind of behavior each day? Which pe people have very distinct types of behavior? Uh, it's, it's really um, kind of an open-ended world. We're not necessarily even told what kind of patterns um, we're interested in, nor how to evaluate those patterns. So we're not necessarily judging one pattern of behavior to be better than the other. Um, and we're not really even sure what a pattern might be. It, uh, it could be, um, it's really pure information, okay? So uh, imagine that you're a patient, open-minded parent, and you know you have your teenager is, is explaining to you about how the world works, right? You know, you you basically listen to a lot of information that you know it's on the same topic, right? And as you hear more and more and more, you start to put together some kind of overall pattern of what the person is trying to get across, right? And uh, you sort of learn, um, not from in a very direct way, but from increasing amount of data, what what um, what the pattern is. Okay, so. Uh, in other examples, e-commerce. So, you know, it's common to cluster users into groups based on their purchasing or web surfing behavior, for example. And then, um, then you know, once you figure out that group, oh, you say, okay, well, all those individuals are surfers, right? Then, uh, which might not be obvious from there at, at the beginning, but, um, uh, you know, or maybe they're all hockey players or maybe they're all artists, etc. Once you figure that out, then maybe they're targetable for merchandise in that direction. Um, in astronomy, uh, you know, well, maybe you don't know, but there's all these telescopes that are pointed out into outer space, 
and you know they're not really well they're, they're, it's a massive problem right they're studying um they're, they're staring at the sky which is a million points or you know literally trillions of, of points of light and we it has to basically pick out interesting events there's no way to systematically go scan through that space by hand you, you use ai to detect um events that occur in the night sky that aren't that don't fit the typical behavior and or the typical like trajectory of stars etc right and that's pretty interesting it's it, it, that that ai technique has discovered all sorts of interesting things from meteors and uh, asteroids that are zooming past earth because they have a different type of motion than other planets and stars to strange um you know electric, like i actually i don't really even know but uh all about these things but uh, you know events that are kind of you know supernova type events black hole type events etc uh things that change the you know um space in ways that you know that they're not typically what you see in the night skies or what you're you're tuned into um of course in biology which I have more familiarity with, we use AI uh, in, a, in every way you can imagine to try and learn uh, new patterns, right? In, in, in unsupervised techniques, for, in, for example. And you're going to see one example today where we try to learn um, subtypes using the K-means approach, an unsupervised technique. Uh, there's another kind of uh, AI, a third branch, um, that's becoming more and more popular right now. It's a, it's a subject of a lot of research. Um, it's a little bit like, I think, conditional learning in psychology. You, you basically want to train your computer a program uh, to do things like play a video game or win at a board game or to drive your car uh, by rewarding and punishing it. So, of course, you don't really whip your computer when it gets something wrong, but you... you um, you basically have it try out different alternatives and then you measure how good each of those different alternatives were. Uh, so I have an example here, which is a bit silly, but you know, if you're building a computerized wheelchair to go downstairs, which was done by the ETH in Switzerland a few years ago, uh, you know, that, that program might start by, you know, lurching, right? That you'd go fast at the stairs. And of course, the person would fall down the stairs and you would say, no, nah, that doesn't work uh, algorithm. You know, you lose 10 points, right? And so the algorithm goes back and it'll naturally start to try and modulate the lurching and maybe it'll make um, smaller steps or slower steps forward. And maybe, you know, it lasts longer. And so before the person falls down the stairs and so it gets minus five instead of minus 10. So it starts to get the idea it's going in the right direction. And um, basically, so there's always this interaction between uh, what happens and what it gets reward, rewarded for. And so you would hope that over time, if it sees enough events, that um, uh, it's going to get really good at playing these games. I'm going to show you some videos in the deep learning section at the end of the course uh, where they've learned they use reinforcement learning to play uh, all the classic video games from Pac-Man and Asteroids, etc. And basically, with very little training, these these deep learners win at those games now uh, in almost no time whatsoever.